My name's Dave DeBow, founder of MoneyPartnerFormula.com, and this show is built for everyday real estate investors who are actively doing deals and looking to scale using other people's money. So if you're an active real estate investor and you want to get featured on this show to talk about your own real estate and capital raising experiences, then just go to DaveInterviewsYou.com. Now let's get rolling with this episode and remember to subscribe for daily interview content. All right, guys, welcome to Property Profits Podcast. I'm your host, Bryce Kaminsky, filling in for Dave Dubo. And have you ever wondered how to scale your real estate portfolio using other people's money? Well, today, my guest, Giancarlo Carangelo, a seasoned real estate investor and manager, is here to share his insights on creative investing strategies, as well as global property management. Giancarlo, welcome to the show, man. Great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. So... You know, the, the question I got to ask is, how'd you get into the game? How did you get started in real estate? Uh, well, my experience started back in 2015. I first got into real estate here in Montreal, Canada, uh, as a real estate broker. Mm-hmm. Um, shortly after that, uh, my, my niche clientele was basically real estate investors looking to build a rental portfolio. Mm-hmm. Shortly after that, I saw a... Um, demand for management within my clientele. And then I transitioned into being a property manager. I did that for a couple of years and and then I decided to become a, a real estate investor myself. Mm. So you started on the property management side of things um, before becoming an investor. Usually it's, I got a property and I suddenly am now a property manager and uh, on it goes. So, um, what was it like managing property before being an owner of property in that sense? Honestly speaking, uh, in my experience, it was great. You know, I, I've um, in my career, I've met a lot of people who've done it vice versa way compared to me where they became landlords um, and then quickly realized that it wasn't for them. They couldn't manage tenants and toilets and, and then it left a bad aftertaste in their mouth. So for me, I think it was great because I spent three, maybe four years as a property manager, uh, learning, getting firsthand experience for third-party clients until I then realized, hey, this is, you know, I could do this. And I got into it myself. As an investor. Interesting, interesting. So what was the uh, most challenging part, would you say, of being a property manager? Definitely think the most challenging part of being a property manager would definitely be um, dealing with certain types of tenants. Mm. They all, you know, they all have a different story and a different background. And there are some great tenants, but then there could be some bad tenant experiences. Mm -hmm. So I think dealing with the bad experiences was a challenge. Um, And then just basically learning as I went through it, you know, was was definitely a a great challenge. So after being a property manager for a while, you started investing in your own properties. What was that like, you know, making the shift? Fairly easy Um, because I had so much experience as a property manager and I had essentially been doing this for third party clients. I I found the shift fairly easy. It was basically from, you know, a light switch went on and said, hey, I've been working with clients and helping them optimize their properties and build their portfolios. Time to get on my own. Yeah, definitely. And less afraid of tenants and toilets, you've already been dealing with them. Did you feel like it was different when it was your property? In terms of the day-to-day management aspect, no, it felt the same. Uh, in terms of the optimizations and the returns, that's when the difference came. Yeah, you were like proactively making sure your property was, because there's not much you can do as the manager if the owner doesn't really want to do something about fixing that doorknob or da-da-da-da-da. You just have to make the recommendation, say, hey, you know, that the door's coming off on the front of the house leave it they say and you're like okay well you're going to get a a maintenance request on that door sooner or later so you should probably do something they're like ah just leave it and then for you you're like okay i'm going to do that you know you're like directly connected to it so um 
OPM, other people's money is a big part of real estate investment. Um, how has that kind of strategy started to play out in your real estate business so far? So towards the beginning of my investment journey, I had the mindset of being a lone wolf, you know, mm -hmm. trying to really take things on myself and, and build my own portfolio. Um, I guess it was sort of like a pride thing to be able to say, hey, I, I did this all, all on my own. Yeah. I hit a plateau at one point um, where then I was, you know, laid all the cards out on the table and said, there's got to be a more efficient way to scale. And then I learned about OPM, other people's mm. money. I educated myself on it. And, and as soon as I started educating myself on it, it took some time to understand. But once I did, I knew that this was a vital part of scaling the estate portfolio. Yeah, I remember when I started in real estate, I started right away in a mentorship company working side by side with some of the coaches there. And um it never even was a thing about buying property on my own. It was always, we started right out the gate using OPM. So I realized really early on that there's always more money than we have available, but it's the finding of the deals and being able to put the people together to like fix it or manage it. The money is everywhere. And I can remember even one of my other colleagues, says, there's no limit of capital in this world. There's a, there's a, a limited supply of ideas and people who can execute them. So when you're out there putting ideas like, oh, this would be an interesting thing to make this 10 unit building a 12 and may fix it up. And then knowing the people to do it, well, the money's attracted, the money's coming to the table, but you also need to be a little bit in the social media of things to, to kind of show, hey, I'm an ideas guy, I execute ideas. So when you look at um, the raising capital, what sort of ways have you, been able to get your message out to the people in your friends and family and, uh, you know, the social networks or even your personal networks? So I definitely think that uh, throughout my entire real estate career, word of mouth has definitely been a huge part of my business. Mm -hmm. um, definitely just making as many contacts as possible, speaking to as many people as I can about real estate, real estate investing, and then eventually those conversations led into, hey, we're looking for money partners. Hey, are you looking to earn maybe a higher return on your money that's currently sitting in a fund or a GIC? Um, and we really, I targeted, for example, a retired demographic, I guess, around me of retired professionals, electricians, accountants, and, and people that have said, you know, hey, maybe I could provide you an opportunity to make a few extra dollars at the end of the year doing private real estate investing. And bit by bit, that word of mouth between, you know, that contact between me and a private investor became word of mouth and more and more people started to understand, you know, what I was doing, how I was doing. So my research here says you've successfully expanded your portfolio globally. Um, could you set a little bit of insights into your approach and ultimately uh, how it went investing in international properties? Yeah, uh, so I definitely, this was newer about a couple of years ago. You know, I would travel a lot to the Dominican Republic. I fell in love with the country, the people, the culture, the scenery and everything. And most recently, I made the decision to, because I've been investing locally in Montreal, uh, Canada. So most recently, I made the decision to try to expand my portfolio outside of the country. Mm -hmm. um, and more and more, I looked into it. I found the investment opportunities, specifically in the Dominican Republic, very, very appealing to investors. Um, you know, short-term rentals, high-end demand. I've noticed the economy in that particular country growing the last three yeah. or four years. So then I decided to obviously, you know, there's a little bit of skepticism investing out of the country, four or five hour flight away. So I decided to do my research on some developers, uh, reputable developers in the country. I've made right. a bit of connections and, and that's when I decided to, hey, listen, it's feasible and let's do it. So what was the first step? Um, not necessarily the first step, but there's currency conversions, uh, taxation things, um, t 
time zone problems. I think they're still in the same time zone, right? They're in the Eastern time zone. Yeah. So what would you say was the most challenging part and what was what you thought would be challenging, but ended up being relatively easy? I think the most challenging part was definitely invest, uh, it, sorry, educating myself for investing in this country. Of course, there's a lot of questions about, you know, financing and how Canadians can get financing in Canadian country. So I really took the time to learn about investing uh, in, in international real estate. I learned about the financing aspect of it, um, certain tax approaches and benefits, pros mm -hmm. and cons. And I really took a good six, seven months to educate myself before actually launch. One of the easier parts that I thought would be more challenging was making the connections in the Dominican Republic and finding good deals, you know? Um, yeah. Quickly realized that it was a lot easier than I anticipated. Do you think that's a competition thing? Like not many people are out there doing what we do. Like we think, you know, in Canada and the United States, there's, it's a business, you know, real estate investing. And I've talked to a few people um, who are investing in places like the the Caribbean and uh, the Dominican Republic. And it doesn't seem like that industry has yet started, or maybe the people aren't really thinking that way. What What's your take on the whole thing? I've, I've been going to the Dominican Republic for almost 10 years now, uh, twice, twice a year vacationing. Yeah. Um, and since I've started actively looking into investing in the Dominican Republic, I noticed demographics like I, I noticed certain demographic of investors looking into international real estate investments and in the last two years i could see more and more i've noticed more and more of these people i've heard into these international investments for certain reasons price wise returns um new development growing economies high rental short-term rental demands mm -hmm. and now it almost seems as though you know, one out of every four people I know is looking to invest in a Caribbean country. And it just seems to be a growing trend amongst Canadians. Mm -hmm. So finding off, off market properties is always key to the success of a real estate investor. Can you walk us through your process for locating these opportunities and negotiating these favorable deals here in Canada and, uh, you know, abroad? I think that when it comes to looking for off-market deals, um, number one, if you're looking to make a profitable investment, then you should be constantly looking for off-market deals. Yeah. It's a great saying that you make money on the buy and not necessarily the sell. So when we started understanding um, how to vet these off-market deals and how to source them and market towards them, we started placing some advertising campaigns. It virtually, uh, physically, um, signs, you know, Facebook ads, marketing, and again, it, word of mouth too. You know, we picked up an off target deal once where a partner of mine had a colleague at his nine to five job who just mentioned that, for example, fortunately his grandmother had passed away, and there was a house involved, and they didn't know what to do with it, and the kids didn't really want to handle it, so. He, he found that as an opportunity to, hey, let's do a private deal. Um, we do look for distressed sales as well, you know, and, and certain tools are out there to help us really target these audience to get these deals or at least get these contacts with these private sellers. Mm -hmm. So, you're, you know, I, I definitely agree with what you're saying. When you say, oh, it's made on the buy, I always think about like, the sale price is not really a fact. You know, what we're going to sell it for is kind of like a gray reaching for it, whatever. But the fact at the front is, did you buy it below the market value? Did you buy it for what it's sticks and bricks? Like, did you get emotional? Did you pay too much? Um, were they just too tough? Did you take a deal that, you know, maybe you just did a deal to do a deal or did you fall in love with the house? And all those things really add up because it's almost a ceiling. If you start here, you might end up 
over budget. But if you start down here and things go and you, you still end up with a little piece of the action at the end of the day. So yeah, definitely on the buy. Um, very, very important. So the second thing that usually will turn a deal sideways is, well, we figured a first one, you, you got to buy it right. But the second thing is that the contractor has to stay within the, you know, they got to paint inside the lines, you know, it's color by number, but they got to stay inside the lines. And it's always challenging finding reliable individuals for re rehab projects. How do you overcome these challenges, especially um, at a distance? You know, if you're thinking about, oh, I got to, you know, fix up this short term rental in the Caribbean or Dominican Republic. How are you managing those and also these? And well, how does that play out? I think for me, in my experience, it's definitely doing my due diligence on the contractor, on the professional that I'm going to work with. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's not a lot of people look at price for this. Um, and, you know, a, a common trend that I see is people trying to go for the best price possible. But for me, it's a little bit more than price. You know, if I'm looking at contractor A versus contractor B, contractor A is charging 15,000 and contractor B is charging 25, then I'm going to dive a little bit deeper. I want to know about how long have they been in business? Um, how many projects have they done? What does their you know, work look like? And I tend to usually go for the longer standing professionals. So, mm. you know, I, it's not really about, granted, you have to be within budget and you have to be within your calculations. You don't want to overspend, but if we're looking at price wise uh, versus experience, and I have one contract who's been doing this for three to five years versus another one who's been doing this between you know ten to fifteen years, I think that in itself speaks for the justification in the price and the experience and the longevity of the business. Yeah, because a project that you know, especially with buy rent refinance and flipping property, you know. It, you do get what you pay for <laughs> like you do you will get what you pay for and sometimes it's like okay we saved 10 grand between the first guy and the second guy but it cost us you know four months of dragging like a, a dead horse through the mud and it's just like if i would have just paid the first guy more or less what he wanted i'd be done in refinance and i had a deal where I'm like, you know what? I'm getting these numbers like 35, 37K. And I'm like, well, I, I'm just going to GC it myself and hire this guy and buy this. And now I'm at Home Depot all the time. And ultimately, the deal actually never got done. I had to sell it short um, all because I tried to save 10 grand. <laughs> I could have just paid the guy that I've already worked with for years who always gets it done. I might not love it, but he would have did it. It would have been done. And um, yeah, it, I never recovered from that decision. So, you know, it, it is a big, a big part of the thing, you know, the contractor can, can cut the whole thing down into the ground. Now, um, what's the secret sauce? You know, what comes easy to you that other people find difficult to do when it comes to this business or business in general? I think my secret sauce, so to speak, is um, I've been in this for a, a while now. I've mm -hmm. gotten hands-on experience as a realtor, as a property manager before an investor. So mm -hmm. I've definitely made long, like long-standing relationships with clients, GCs, pointers, electricians, all sorts of professionals um, that I have within my network that I could A, count on and B, trust. So if I'm sending somebody to do a job, I know with peace of mind, he's going to go in and do the job. And I really, I'm, 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 I have that advantage because I learned the business before I dove in as an investor. Yeah. So you, you've got those, cause that's that, I would say that's one of the most challenging things, you know, people decide, Oh, I want to flip houses. I want to buy rentals. Cool. Awesome. And then they go and buy one and then it's like, okay, the bank will hold your hand all the way through that process and the, you'll get the keys. And it's like, now what? And now you go to Kijiji Craigslist and you start dialing random guys from the yellow pages, come and fix my house. And it's just like that, that can be one of the most um, challenging positions. Cause like you're saying, you know, who knows how long they've been in the game, but there's also sharks in those waters. 
you know, just like there's loan sharks on the buy, there's um, contractor sharks out there who aren't on the Better Business Bureau registry, or if they are, they've got a strike or two, but are you checking that? You know, it's, there's people who are in business still to this day because they prey on the unknowing new investor and then that's it. So they, the deal's done and maybe that ends their whole career. So what, uh, what advice would you have for aspiring, aspiring real estate investors looking to kind of replicate your success and scale their portfolios? I would definitely say this is a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, take mm. the time to properly educate yourself before you dive into it. Education goes far beyond HGT uh, and the things that we see. You know, education is about informing yourself, um, getting as much information as you can. In my experience, joining investor groups and coaching mentoring programs to learn uh, about this. Because what we see on HGTV and I could I, I could attest to this firsthand is not realistic. Uh, they show all the glitz and the glamour, but they don't show the cloudy days, you know, and the reality. So take the time, invest in your education when it comes to real estate investing, um, and remember that it's a marathon and not a sprint. Because I've seen a lot of people burn out so fast. For example, people who told me, "Yeah, I used to invest in real estate. Bought my first reflex but then i realized managing tenants is not for me because mm -hmm. they all had a certain idea in their head that was deceiving so definitely education is key before locating yourself in a deal or in a journey that could potentially go south yeah definitely so you know you've had some um success bringing in money partners into into your business, you know, especially as you're expanding, it's really one of the only ways to expand your portfolio apart from, you know, saving for another five years and buying something else. Like you gotta, you gotta cut people in on the action. What do you think it is that helps you get people to come in? You know, what is it about your process that gets people on board? And secondly, once they're on board, how do you make sure that they're staying comfortable? Because a lot of times getting them in, keeping them in is almost more important. So tell me a little bit about your uh, raising capital and what you, why do you think people invest with you? So I have the unfair advantage of having worked with uh, clients in my brokerage practice and management practice where I've helped them optimize their revenues, optimize their properties, and mm. build their portfolios. So I have a track record behind me to show mm. that I'm not only talking the talk, but I can walk. And then when it comes down to approaching new investors, I leverage that track. I say, listen, I've worked with these clients. Here are the properties when we bought them. Here are the properties after our two-year lift project you know, where we've optimized all four units. This is what we bought it at. This is what they refinanced it at. And it's about knowing market trends and numbers. Knowing your markets, knowing your numbers, sticking tight to those numbers. And the first one's always the hardest. You know, getting a new investor in to say, hey, listen, I'm willing to, uh, you know, take a chance and invest with you is always the hardest. It might take two or three, maybe four, conversations with them mm. where they say okay let's do this once they make that once they make the return and they see that hey I'm not only am I getting paid back but I'm making profit off this uh, for example I coach a lot of retired professionals where they have their money locked in to funds where the returns are not so high and then they say hey not only did I get paid back I made a higher return than I could have with a traditional bank then they have more and more trust and faith in the process and they want to come back for more you know and after a while you don't call them they call me hey is there any deals going on is there anything we could be involved in you know be it in canada us dominican and definitely uh, sticking to your word and showing them that you can produce results is valuable. 
when it comes to real estate investing and partnerships with yeah. Yeah, returning the money on time, in full. Um, how about during the process? What sort of like reporting or processes do you have in place to let them know things are moving along? So every passive investor, money investor is different. Some require weekly check-ins, some only want monthly check-in. Ones that we've worked with a couple of times who trust us say, okay, you know, call me when we're done or call me if something goes wrong. Other than that, we're okay. So we're, we're very um, diverse when it comes to that. You know, we always keep, we always like to keep them informed. If I haven't had, you know, had a check-in with a professor and send them a quick email, some photo updates. Um, this is what we're looking at right now. Here's where we are with progress. We're still on track for the timeline. So on and so forth. Awesome. Awesome. So if people want to invest with you, they want to find out more, they want to connect with you, uh, what should they do? How do they find you? So I'm on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. Instagram, and I have a website, LinkedIn Giancarlo Carangelo. So it's G-I-A-N-C-A-R-L-O, Carangelo, Car and Angelo. Instagram is at Carangelo Real Estate. And then I have my website, Carangelo Management. So that's Carangelo, M-G-M-N-T.com, where they could uh, send an email through there or even get my number. Awesome, awesome. Well, I really appreciate you stopping by and... Um... Yeah, big things are on the horizon and uh, you're already doing big things. So I appreciate you stopping by. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having no problem. Until next time, guys, we'll catch you on the next episode. Hey there, I really hope you enjoyed that episode. And as always, if you want to listen to more daily interview content, make sure you subscribe. And if you're an active real estate investor and you're doing deals and you'd like to get featured on this show, then just head over to daveinterviewsyou.com. Now at moneypartnerformula.com, we help real estate investors to create a process for predictably getting capital so they can do more deals without relying on hard money lenders or the banks. We do this by building them a private capital marketing system. Now, if you want help turning yourself into a big money capital attraction machine, then book a call with our team to see how we can help. Just visit moneypartnerformula.com to find out more. All right, take care and we'll see you on the next interview.